more people have been to space than have been to see the Titanic. Stockton Rush, founder of OceanGate, is planning to increase the membership of that exclusive club. Where is your excitement factor on this? Oh, definitely at 11. <laughs> it's <not> 11. <laughs> His underwater vessel, called Cyclops II and now under construction, will look like this and will be able to carry five people to the Titanic more than two miles down. People will enter and exit through the dome. One goal is to generate a 3D model of the wreck before it's too late. I've heard some uh, researchers say that the Titanic will melt away and be gone in 20 years. OceanGate is inviting researchers and explorers to join them for an eye-popping price. 105129 Dollars. Because that is inflation adjusted price of a first class ticket on the Titanic in 1912. Even so, all 54 seats for the 2018 trips have already sold out. Rush says his submersible is one of the safest forms of transportation in the world. You believe the Cyclops 2 is pretty much invulnerable? By the time we're done testing it, I believe it's pretty much invulnerable. And that's pretty much what they said about the Titanic. That's right. <laughs> And I will go on all the first dives, put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to show you a series of clips involving the University of Washington, Collier Aerospace, and NASA. Let's start with UW. This was posted on December 10th, 2013. Cyclops, a new ultra-strong lightweight manned submersible born of the partnership between the UW's Applied Physics Laboratory and OceanGate. Cyclops was developed with the goal of being a, a totally new approach to manned submersibles. Cyclops is designed to take up to five people as deep as 10,000 feet. It could do both research, environmental assessment work for oil and gas, mining, surveying work, biopharma, and even adventure tourism. OceanGate brings to the table experience in small subs. This is Antipodes veteran of more than 100 dives in the past two years. This is a new, kind of a new venture for us. APL brings to the table the ability for a company like OceanGate to come into the university and gain access to resources and gain access to technology that they may not have available to them. APL brings in the ability to do computational fluid dynamics. In other words, how much force, how much power does it require to move this vehicle through the water at a given speed? Cyclops is aimed at customers who need to charter deep sea access, previously the domain of military submarines, or submersibles tethered to support vessels of a size and cost Cyclops won't need. We can use an ocean-going tug that might be $10,000 a day versus a specialized research ship that would run, say, $100,000 a day. Cyclops will employ carbon fiber reinforced plastic, the same material Boeing uses to build jetliner wings. New carbon fiber manufacturing techniques, new high purity glass, as well as new control systems. Why risk people where robots can go? Subs are extremely safe when operated as a research vessel, not as a military sub. Robots can't do everything. So there, there's a place for, for people in the ocean, and we're looking at first commercial operations in 2016. This next one was posted on January 12th. 2016. Keep in mind that UW also updated their video description. Clarification. June 2023. APL-UW collaborated with OceanGate on the shallow water vehicle Cyclops-1. APL-UW played a supporting role in the early development of Cyclops-2. Video editing may not fully capture the details of the partnership. It goes on to say that critical milestones for Cyclops, a new submersible designed to take as many as five people deep beneath the ocean surface, eventually as deep as 4,000 meters, more than three and a half miles. At the University of Washington in Seattle, the first test of a scale model of the Cyclops filament wound carbon fiber hull designed and manufactured by Spencer Composites in collaboration with OceanGate and APLUW. Critical milestones for Cyclops, a new submersible designed to take as many as five people deep beneath the ocean surface eventually as deep as 4,000 meters, more than three and a half miles. At the University of Washington in Seattle, the first test of a scale model of Cyclops' new filament-wound carbon fiber hull, designed and manufactured by Spencer Composites in collaboration with OceanGate and APLUW. We're testing a one-third scale uh, model of the pressure vessel that will be used on Cyclops 2. Initially when we launched the Cyclops program we uh, planned to have Cyclops 2 go to 3,000 meters and we found through our engineering that in fact we can achieve uh, at least 4,000 meters and maybe more. Uh, Cyclops 3 has been planned to be 6,000. 
The pressure at 6,000 meters, about 8,762 pounds per square inch. By comparison, Navy submarines commonly operate at depths of 180 to 250 meters. The pressure vessel consists of three parts, a cylinder and two hemispheres. One of the unique elements of this test will be the hemispheres. So the hemispheres are also carbon fiber, which has never been done uh, at this uh, size or to this depth. The goal of this test, pressure of 6,000 pounds per square inch. Here, pressure is raised gradually. At the 71 minute mark, the pressure increased to 4,000 pounds per square inch. At 72 minutes, the pressure was turned up to 5,000 PSI but three minutes later, at a pressure of 4,285 PSI, representing a depth of about 3,000 meters, the test was aborted by apparent water intrusion into one of the carbon fiber domes. Yeah, she's open. That is the most risky part of the test and the most uh, difficult to analyze. Since it's never been done, there's no test data on how carbon fiber in a hemisphere will respond to the pressures. This initial test was deemed a success at 4,000 PSI, the equivalent of 2,800 meters. The carbon fiber hemispheres are now back at the manufacturer, Spencer Composites in Sacramento, for analysis ahead of additional testing down the road. In September, this successful test of another APLUW OceanGate design collaboration, LARS, Launch and Retrieval System. To avoid surface turbulence, the Cyclops vehicle on LARS is submerged 5 to 10 meters, providing a stable underwater launch platform. To surface, the process is reversed. Lars eliminates the need for large and costly vessels. Look at, we can use an ocean-going tug that might be $10,000 a day versus a specialized research ship that would run, say, $100,000 a day. The idea, says Rush, is for Cyclops to enable deep ocean diving for explorers, archaeologists, scientists, movie makers, and commercial users. Cyclops submersibles and related systems are the products of a commercial venture partnership OceanGate and APLUW. We couldn't have done it without that partnership. The Applied Physics Lab has been effectively our engineering partner. Carbon fiber is at the core of this aerospace engineering and manufacturing facility in Paulding County. This is a, a liner that goes inside a, a turbine engine. Greg Kress is the company's co-founder, an engineer and instructor, and a big believer in composites, like those used to build commercial aircraft and used for the hull of the doomed Titan submersible. The nice thing about composites is, is they are the latest, greatest space age material, and carbon fiber leading the pack. Inside here is is the walk-in freezer. Kress says it starts with a fibrous cloth stored in a freezer. This is carbon fiber right here. Here's a roll of carbon fiber sealed in the bag. The cloth is bound with resin and superheated in a two-story tall oven, yielding material that's strong and aerodynamic. The Boeing 787 Dreamliner is all made out of carbon fiber. Like if you just scratch this or hit it or something like that. But Kress says it also requires rigorous inspection. Any kind of a scratch, a nick, or a gouge, or a hole is going to cause a stress concentration. Especially if it's going to be used under hundreds of feet of water with people inside of it. It's not what we consider rocket science to inspect it. It's non-destructive inspection using ultrasound, which is the same kind of ultrasound that they use in the medical industry to see what's going on inside your body. Kress estimates an ultrasound inspection of the Titan would have cost about $20,000. Cost effective, he says, especially if passengers are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for a ride to the bottom of the sea. Non-destructive inspection is not a rarity in the world of composites. It's what we do all the time. Kress says carbon fiber has proven its value as a space age building material. The Titan accident, he says, has proven the value of testing it rigorously. In Paulding County, Doug Richards, 11 Alive News. What about Collier Aerospace? 
Here's their Facebook and Twitter posts on March 22, 2022. On Facebook, they mentioned, Venturing 4,000 meters down to the ocean floor is a lot of pressure, literally. But OceanGate is well-equipped for the journey. In July 2021, OceanGate descended to the sunken remains of the Titanic in its revolutionary carbon fiber and titanium submersible, Titan. Collier Aerospace had the opportunity to be a part of this groundbreaking expedition during the development of Titan's carbon fiber hull, which was designed with the help of our structural analysis and design software. Stay tuned for details on Titan's future endeavors and check out their website below for more information. And then on Twitter, it's generally the same message. In July 2021, OceanGate descended to the sunken remains of the Titanic in its revolutionary carbon fiber and titanium submersible, Titan. Our structural design and analysis software was used to develop the whole of Titan, allowing us to be a part of this groundbreaking project. And of course, they've been deleting some posts. For example, here's one from June 15th, 2022. Today is the day. Our customer OceanGate begins a historic series of eight-day missions to survey and record the remains of the Titanic. The missions will be completed in the submersible Titan, which was developed with the help of our HyperX software. Good luck to the crew. Let's move on to NASA. And there's two press releases for us to look at. On February 26, 2020, OceanGate released this. NASA and OceanGate enter into an agreement to collaborate in the development, manufacturing, and testing of new carbon fiber pressure vessels. The resulting pressure vessel will be used for the deep sea submersibles. And it also specifically called out NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, which would serve as the facility where the development and manufacturing of a new aerospace-grade hull is completed. And in that press release, Stockton Rush said this, We continue to receive more demand for Titanic, deep-sea research, and environmental supervision of deep-sea mining missions that very few submersibles in the world have the capability of supporting. NASA's advanced composite manufacturing capability is ideally suited for the high precision and high quality requirements of our latest hull design. OceanGate's primary goal is to open the oceans and make exploring, researching, and documenting deep ocean sites safer and more accessible to not only researchers and governmental agencies, but also to citizen explorers. We look forward to working with NASA to do just that. And then we'll end it with a quote from NASA. NASA is committed to cutting-edge composites research and development that will not only further our deep ocean exploration goals, but will also improve materials and manufacturing for American industry, said John Vickers, Principal Technologist for Advanced Manufacturing Technology at NASA. This Space Act agreement with OceanGate is a great example of how NASA partners with companies to bring space technology back down to Earth. Now there's also another press release, and this was on March 9th, 2022, and the upper half is worth reviewing right now. OceanGate worked in consultation with a team of engineers at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, throughout the development and manufacturing of Titan, the world's only carbon fiber and titanium submersible capable of carrying five crew members to the wreck of the RMS Titanic at 3,800 meters. This achievement marks the beginning of a new era of exploration, offering a vast range of opportunities for deep sea investigation and scientific research. And then we'll skip the next paragraph and go to the following one. NASA's collaboration with OceanGate was made possible through the Space Act. The Space Act was designed to benefit both NASA's diverse missions, including the Artemis program and future exploration initiatives and organizations like OceanGate. NASA's expertise in the design and automated fiber placement layup of composite hulls was extremely valuable on this project, said Stockton Rush, CEO and founder of OceanGate Inc. And that's gonna be an important phrase, automated fiber placement, but let's keep going. The ability to construct Titan's pressure hull with aerospace grade carbon fiber in manufacturing protocols results in a submersible which weighs a fraction of what other deep diving crude submersibles weigh. This weight reduction allows us to carry a significantly greater payload, which we use to carry five crew members, a pilot, researchers, and mission specialists. Titan represents a consequential step forward for human exploration of the ocean, which few realize constitutes 99% of Earth's livable volume. And then the last one right here, NASA Space Shuttle astronaut Dr. Scott Perzinski provides additional perspective. Exploration of our deep oceans is imperative to gaining a better understanding of our blue planet. Spending many weeks in space as a NASA astronaut looking down upon our planet gave me a deeper appreciation 
for the fragility of our planet, says Dr. Scott Perzinski, OceanGate's immersible pilot in training. In 2021, I had the wonderful opportunity to dive to the Titanic site as an OceanGate Expeditions crew member. This cutting-edge submersible technology has the power to change the way we explore our deep oceans and understand our planet. I look forward to our second expedition this summer. And some of you may recognize Scott Perzinski because he's been featured in some OceanGate promo videos. But here's another clip of him. It's a dream finally realized after years of setbacks, exploring the most famous shipwreck on the planet. Everyone around the world knows the Titanic and the fact that it's 12,800 feet beneath the ocean and really inaccessible. It's sort of the, uh, the Everest of, of submersible diving. Former NASA astronaut Scott Perzinski loves exploration. Astronaut Scott Perzinski is starting to install the hardware that was built on board the station. With five shuttle missions under his belt, including a trip aboard Shuttle Discovery with John Glenn and several spacewalks like this one in 2007 to repair solar panels outside the International Space Station, we don't fly a little force. he is always looking for adventure. I'm driven to uh, go to places that are difficult to reach that really involve commitment. Perzinski has been committed to Ocean Gate for more than a decade. His wife, Dr. Mina Wadwa, or Minnie, will be along for the ride as well. She, too, is a space junkie of sorts. You've probably heard about NASA's Perseverance rover on Mars right now, exploring and collecting rocks. Well, she's in charge of making sure the mission to bring them back to Earth goes smoothly so we can learn more about the red planet. Robotic exploration is incredible at being able to do that, but the human experience is something that's totally different, and being able to see it with your own eyes is going to be transformational. They are joined by mission specialists who are getting a rare opportunity. You have the pilot back here. These screens would normally be tilted in. As OceanGate CEO Stockton Rush looks to make this an annual tradition. There's so many things underwater to explore and by taking people to the Titanic and getting awareness of what can be done underwater, I hope we'll get a cadre of mission specialists that say, look, I want to go every year. All right, so let's go back to NASA. Going back to the March 9th, 2022 press release, there is that one phrase, automated fiber placement. If you also look at the list of active Space Act agreements, and this is as of June 30th, 2020, OceanGate is also listed. But if you look at the highlighted column, that stands for titles or purpose. It says OceanGate automated fiber placement development. And then you'll also notice the dates on the right. The first one's going to be the execution date. That's February 2020. And then the next one on the right is the expiration date. So it expired February 2022. All right, so what is automated fiber placement? Well, NASA has this interesting video that discusses automated fiber placement. It's not necessarily for OceanGate, but it's a webinar that explains the process for how aerospace manufacturers will be using composite parts for their aircraft. And also a quick note, this video is from NASA's Langley Research Center in Virginia. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sean Sullivan, and I will be your host for this NASA Technology Transfer Program webinar on NASA's calibration system for automated fiber placement for the automated fiber placement technology. Our presenter today is Peter Juarez. Peter is a research engineer with the Non-Destructive Evaluation Sciences Branch at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. He specializes in multiple fields of NDE, including ultrasound, thermography, guided wave, and advanced automated data processing. The technology that inspired this patent, the in-situ thermal inspection system for AFP, has been in development at Langley for the last four years and has been utilized in several prototype and production products. Following pre Peter's presentation on the technology, I will be giving a short presentation on how NASA licenses technology to outside organizations. Now, before we get started, I'd like to point out that all of your microphones will be muted throughout all of this presentation. You also can't see the full attendees list, but many of you are here and are filing in at this time. But if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box. It should be in your lower right corner of your screen, and we'll get to them during the last 15 minutes of our Q&A session at the end. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you, Peter. Great. Thank you, Sean. So yeah, uh, like you said, my name is Peter Juarez. Uh, um, thank you for joining me today. So this presentation, we're going to get a little bit into the weeds because uh, this, this technology, this innovation really enables a, another technology that we've been working on. And I have to explain sort of the problem space for why that technology exists and what kind of value this brings. And so we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Okay, so uh, AFP, what is it? Uh, AFP stands for Automated Fiber Placement, and it's the next generation way of 
how aerospace manufacturers are going to be making their composite parts for their aircraft. And what it can be sort of uh, analogous is, is a giant robotic tape dispenser. You have spools of carbon fiber prepreg that are cut to a certain width, um, and these, these spool, these, uh, this tape is called a toe. Uh, those toes are lined up in a, a row next to each other, and that row is called a course. And then the, uh, a robotic platform applies that tape onto a surface, whether it be a mandrel or a mold or some sort of tooling surface. And uh, it does that layer by layer to build up additively a complex structure uh, made of composites uh, for use mostly in aerospace components. Um, if you ever went uh, flown on Air, uh, Boeing 737, uh, the fuselage section and parts of the wing are made with automated fire placement. And uh, so it's, it's a, a great way to repeatedly build large uh, composite structures um, and have you know, very little scrap waste because you're you're now putting composite almost exactly where the uh, it needs to be, and you don't have to trim off any excess. Now there are some uh, so every thing that you're going to see in this presentation uh, was done on a AFP machine we have here at Langley called Isaac, which stands for the Integrated Structural Assembly of Advanced Composites, and so I just. Uh, Credit where credit's due, they've enabled this research uh, to be possible, and we wouldn't have been able to get this far without them. And so AFP does have uh, uh, some challenges when this layup. So there's a lot of advantages, but there's some disadvantages. And one of the things is the toes that you're laying down don't always go where exactly you want them to, whether it be because of uh, error in the motion of the robot, wandering of the toes, complex geometry, so on and so forth. There's a lot of variability. There can be a lot of variability on where the placement, uh, where the placement of the toe actually ends up, and so those defects are primarily are concerned with overlaps and gaps. Uh, but there's also thing like FOD, where there's uh, material underneath where you laid up, and that's not supposed to be included into, into there. Uh, there's buckling and, and other things like that. Uh, but the my primary concern is uh, overlaps and gaps, and what those are is when the toe of uh, uh, in one in, in the course, if one toe is overlapping another, or if, if there's a gap between the toes as you're laying them up, and those types of defects can uh, impart as much as like a 32% reduction in strength, depending on what your application is and what the uh, severity of the defect is. Uh, so these kind of defects have to be caught before the material is baked in an autoclave, and the overlapping gap defects are there for life. And so the, the way they, they, they detect for these right now is completely 100% manual inspection every, every single ply. And so they go, you have technicians that go up after each ply with magnifying optics and, and lights uh, to try to find these gap and overlap defects. Uh, and it's, it's a very, you know, it's not a very precise way of measurement. Because if you look on the picture on the left, we have a twist and uh, two overlaps and a gap in that panel. But it's such a low contrast environment. It has uh, the composite itself has so much texture. Uh, unless you're at the right angle, even at, from this picture, you can't tell that those defects are actually there. I know they're there because I put them there. But just been looking at that, you're not going to be able to uh, understand. Them. I, and and so much time is devoted to this that uh, studies have been done to see what the allocation of cell time is actually for done with inspection. And you're looking at about 42 percent of the of total cell time used for inspection and data review. And while only 19% of that cell time is actual physical layup. And ideally, you want those two numbers reversed, uh, but that's that's what exists today. And so uh, before I get into the technology we've developed, I'll, I'll say there's a whole bunch of people working on this problem right now. Uh, there's systems that are being developed that use laser profilometry, that use vision systems, that use multiple spectral systems, and there's a whole bunch of advantages and disadvantages to all these. Um, this is more uh, what we've developed using infrared is just another way to do it. Um, and so this is the technology, the innovation I'm going to be describing today can benefit all these technologies, not just the one uh, that we've developed here at Langley. But what we did here at Langley was we decided, hey, let's put an infrared camera on the AFP machine. And since every single AFP machine has some sort of preheating element that is leading the compaction roller, um, that's heating up the substrate that, or the material that was already laid down so that when you lay down new material, it's tacky enough and can consolidate and compact well into the substrate. Uh, and so what we're doing with the infrared camera is we're watching as that preheated substrate, the heat from that, goes through the material that we just laid down. 
And so with that, you can impart some sort of knowledge on how well you laid down that material. And so just looking at overlaps and gaps, for instance, if you have an overlap, now you're conducting that heat through twice the amount of material that you were before. And so it's going to have a different characteristic heating and cooling curve. Uh, immediately, it's going to show up as a cold spot. Um, and on the flip side, if you have a gap, you're not going to see any heating and cooling. It's just going to be immediately cooling. And it's going to be a much higher temperature because you're looking at just the preheated substrate itself. And uh, so, in fact, anything that happens between those, the, the old layer, uh, the uh, substrate and the new layer, we can see in the thermal data. And so they just, we did that, uh, we, we've developed that system and put it on Isaac uh, here at NASA Langley, and it's been used on several different projects for their quality control and process, um, uh, process development cycle. And we've been really, really successful in that. And uh, so j just to give you an idea of what that kind of data looks like, now we have a uh, image here. This is one single frame of the movie that we record with the IR camera. And now the overlaps and gaps are readily apparent in the course. Um, the uh, bright lines are going to be the the actual gaps in between toes, and the dark lines are going to be the overlaps. Um, and so uh, this is distinct enough and and you know obvious enough that you can even build a computer vision system, uh, some sort of machine learning alg algorithm to automatically identify these defects and call them out at the end of a plot, which is something we've done as well. So anyway. Um, once you get that, you can even do some more complex things with the data where you can construct a, a holistic model, a data reconstruction of your entire part, your entire ply, and you can see how your process parameters are exactly affecting your part quality. And so not only can you track a defect across from one course to the other, but you can also track defects through the plies. And so now if something's not in spec, or if something is uh, a defect is in spec, in specifications, for one ply, but it's lined up over uh, 12 other defects below it, then all of a sudden that's out of spec, you can track it if you have um, sensitive enough data and you can reconstruct it three-dimensionally like this. Now, so that's all great. We, we, we've done that. Uh, we, we, you can add uh, extra value at, and decision-making support to your project with this, but there's one issue. No matter what inspection system you use, you have to be able to qualify that inspection system and you have to be able to uh, have confidence in the inspection system's results. And the way you do that is through calibration. And so with calibration, you can say definitively, my uh, inspection system can pick up this defect, this size, and uh, you know, sort of give context to how well your system is gonna perform in a real world application. And to make it, and to, in order to calibrate it, you need to have representative defects, which is the crux of the innovation that I'm going to be describing here today. And so let's say you wanted to make toe tape defects right now. Uh, what most people do is they'll lay up a course of material, and then they will, using the programming of the robot, lay up another course that slightly overlaps the course that you just laid up, and now you have an overlap. And then on the third course, you uh, use the computer, the uh, programming again to make a small gap between the second course and the third course. And so that works. Uh, but in, in real life, you're not always going to have a overlapping gap at the edge of courses. A lot of times they'll happen in the middle of the course. And sometimes um, making those little adjustments are going to be hard with complex geometry. Um, and so not only that, but the play, the machine placement itself is not 100% accurate. And we know this because labs and gaps happen right now anyway. And so how do you make repeatable defects of a known size and of known quantity and known location without um, uh, it, during the actual layup and not in some sort of post layup process? Because uh, another way you can do this is you lay up a perfect ply and then you pick up toes and place them uh, to make an artificial gap. But that's not really a in-process inspection. You're, you're now inspecting as a post-process, and things are a little different. And so how we solve this problem, well, first, let's look at the cross-section of, of an overlap and gap defect. Um, on an overlap, you have two layers of material. On a normal layup, you only have one layer of material on top of the substrate. And on a gap, you have zero layers of material. You only have the substrate. And so if you look at this, just this cross-section, you, you can realize that these uh, these layers of material do not have to be continuous to look like a defect. And so what you could do is just take one single toe and uh, shave it, sort of shape it to be a little thinner than the rest of the toes, 
And when it lays up, it's going to have a natural gap in between the other toes because it's supposed to be laid up right next to it. Um, and it'll look like a gap, uh, a natural occurring gap. Conversely, if you take that material that you took off the, uh, the original toe and put it on a different toe, now that you have two layers of material, that's going to look like an overlap in your, in your data. And that's exactly what we did. So here we have a, uh, an eighth inch uh, overlap and gap defect that we simulated where we took a little tab out from a, a piece of a toe. Uh, and this was before it was even laid up. It, we did it while it was still on the machine. And so when the machine laid this up, it made a overlap and gap defect exactly where we wanted it of a known size and quantity. Um, and so, you know, so that, that works we wanted an easy way to do it as well. So what we made is a small sort of stencil jig that can fit on the toe and you can allows you to use it when it's the materials on the spool or even um, uh, when it, the material is still in the machine. And so you, you line that jig up with your, or that stencil up with the toe you want to cut, you put the cover over it, and then you use a razor blade or an exacto knife, or even uh, you can have cut it, cutting elements in the stencil itself. So when you close the lid, it automatically cut it. Um, but once you cut that tab out and place that into an adjacent toe and lay that up, now you have something that looks like to your inspection system, exactly like an overlapping gap defect. And by print, by making these stencils in different sizes, you can simulate different sizes of overlapping gap defect. So not only the length, but also the width. And so again, that's what we that's what we use to make this defect. It's a quarter inch, uh, an eighth of an inch overlapping gap defect. And by doing this, um, one of our fears was we're going to compromise the integrity of the of the toe, and it might jam up the machine. It was fine. Um, this is half the width of the toe that we cut off, and it's still laid up perfectly. And then, um, in order to really qualify your system, you want to see how, what's the smallest defect you can get. And so we went smaller and smaller to get uh, even more fine resolution on our inspection system. And so here we have a two millimeter overlap and gap. Uh, it's getting harder to see because again, this low contrast environment, we have a overlap tab that we pasted right here and a gap right here. And again, these were all made before it was laid up. And then here's a one millimeter gap um, and overlap that was uh, we used for calibration. And so what do these artificial defects look like? Well, it, they look exactly like overlaps and gaps in, in, the, in a real life setting. Um, and here we have a two millimeter gap simulated right here. And uh, again, it just shows up as a, as a bright spot, or a bright line in the layup between the coarse toes. And here we have one of those eighth inch overlapping gap defects, um, you know, very, very apparent. And then this on the right is a sort of a, a data reconstruction to show the entire ply where that defect is. And it, and from just looking at it, it looks like a toe just immediately shifted over to the right by an eighth of an inch and then went back on the course. Um, so, and so you can use this data to not only qualify your inspection system, um, but now say if you wanted to make some sort of automated defect recognition algorithm using machine learning that requires a lot of training data, now you can uh, build uh, mountains of data sets without having to find these defects in the wild and make a train, uh, train your machine learning algorithm to find these in a real world application.